Hello everybody and welcome to the Tuesday edition of Video Clips and uh, just a few announcements first of all. Um, the first thing is I'll respond to a little bit of feedback that I get back on, on um, YouTube and I can't publish all of the comments because some of them are not very nice and I don't really care about that but let me just give you a clue. If you want me to do something for you, capital letters and screaming at me and swearing, not the best way to do it, you know. So um, just to clear up a constant misunderstanding, if you're looking for references for the articles, my articles are really well referenced but you have to subscribe to the Health Priest Library. So we do a lot of stuff for free around here but the Health Priest Library isn't free. It's very reasonable, $29.95 a year. If you want the references, that's where you find them, okay? So yelling at me won't help. You still have to subscribe to the library, just so you know. All right, a um, couple of announcements. Um, we have um, special packages for May. Some of you know that May is always right before we start the Summer Diet and Lifestyle course. We always have some packages that include that. Uh, we also have a fabulous new Food Over Medicine coaching program, and I'll tell you why I developed this. Um, we have a lot of people who are doctors, nurses, dietitians, taking our programming and the reason is they want to be really good clinicians these are the people that are always looking for more information and that sort of thing um, but then we have some people that are not doctors nurses clinicians dietitians and and they're looking for something that's a little bit more simple a little bit more on the coaching end, and and just generally helping people not so specific and so um, I thought well this food over medicine book I wrote really said I mean the title says it all food over medicine for people who want to just talk to people about using food and diet and life style choices to improve their health in a very general sense. Um, I've come up with a great coaching program with five modules. It can be done online. Some of it's live if you choose to participate in the live discussions. And um, as always, when we introduce something new, we have a really, really special offer. So if you're interested in that, send me an email and I'll send you back information. So, uh, and then keep those inquiries about careers coming. A lot of you guys are writing to me, which is great. Um, you know, if I, if what we do here doesn't help you, I can still share a lot of great information with you. We've been in business for 23 years and we don't know everything, but we've helped a lot of people, which has given us an enormous amount of experience. And I can tell you what people are looking for, what they're willing to pay for, um, and a lot about how things operate around here, which might be helpful to you. So I can share general information with you or guide you in the direction of specific things I think you should do. So Pam Popper at MSN.com, that's how you contact me. All right, so this next, um, this article that I'm going to uh, discuss today um, is disturbing on a whole lot of different levels, all right? And it basically starts, the title of the article is Evidence Doesn't Persuade Doctors. And I think this is the most startling and stark version or justification for informed medical decision making I've come in contact with in my entire time in this field. All right, so Dr. John Mandrola, I have done our other articles and video clips on his work. Um, we don't know each other, but actually some of the stuff that he writes could be in our library because he's very much on the same page and he's very distressed about the state of medicine, writes about it a lot, and he also writes about informed decision making. Well, he posted an article on Medscape which shows why the patient has to be informed in order to avoid harm. In the article, the Mandrola describes a situation in which he ended up debating with a doctor who he described as a, quote, thoughtful interventional cardiologist. You might change your mind about that description by the end of this. Um, the debate was about the use of percut percutaneous coronary intervention, or PCI, which we used to call angioplasty with stent. Some of us still call it that. Uh, PCI involves the use of a catheter to place a stent and open up a blood vessel that has become uh, narrowed or clogged up due to plaque buildup or atherosclerosis. Well, the debate took place between the two of them in front of the annual staff meeting at the hospital um, that Mandrola works at. And the audience was doctors that came from a whole lot of different disciplines. So most of them were not cardiologists, in fact. So he felt that this would be an interesting group to try this debate in front of because many of them would not be cardiologists and they could just look at the evidence and then and then weigh in. So the discussion was limited to whether or not patients benefited from stents in addition to medical therapy and lifestyle changes. So it was a pretty narrow field. All right, so Mandrola stated his case first. 
and he cited several trials. And, and I usually, I included the trials that he cited. I actually have the links in the article here because I think that this is very important and it goes to the point that I'm going to make by the end of this. Well, um, one was balloon angioplasty trials in the 1990s that showed that stents improved chest pain but didn't reduce the risk of myocardial infarction or death. So improvement in symptoms, not much improvement in outcomes. So if you're a little bit more comfortable before you die, I don't think that's the outcome that you're looking for. Uh, the MASS-2 trial compared PCI to bypass or medical therapy in patients, 90% of whom had the Widowmaker lesion. None of the three options improved survival and PCI did not reduce the risk of, of uh, heart attack. The COURAGE trial involved more than 2,200 patients and showed no benefit for PCI. The authors of the COURAGE trial have subsequently gone back and reanalyzed the data trying to find some subset population of patients that would benefit from PCI. They couldn't find any. The addition of drug-eluting stents didn't improve outcomes. Uh, still no benefit. Even relief from chest pain was temporary because longer-term follow-up in some of the trials that showed that chest pain was reduced showed that the effect wears off after about three years. By far, and I wrote about this Orbita trial, the most important trial regarding PCI was the Orbita trial because it involved 200 patients who were randomly assigned to real PCI or a sham, sham procedure. Neither the patients nor their doctors knew which patients were having the real versus the sham procedure. There were no differences between the groups in terms of chest pain, exercise time, the physician's evaluation of the degree of chest pain, or the quality of life scores. No differences. So Mandrolo presented all of this and then he rested his case. The response? Well, the thoughtful cardiologist responded with pictures of blockages that looked kind of scary and stories about people who chose not to have PCI and then later needed surgery. And, um, and he talked about how unnecessary that all was because if people would just get the stunt in the first place, these disasters wouldn't have happened. So he engaged in storytelling. Not surprisingly, the doctors in the audience were equally thoughtful and voted for PCI. Mandrola's response, and this is a quote, evidence doesn't persuade even physicians. He went on to say that experience shows that a major problem with evidence-based medicine is this. If a treatment is no better than placebo for relieving symptoms and improving outcomes, there is no pro side to debate. What's more, he said, if a clinician's gut feeling, emotion, and expertise can trump evidence, why even bother to do clinical trials? Seriously, why would you bother to go through all that expense? Over 61 trials, according to Mandrola, have shown PCI to be useless, and let it, yet it seems that nobody is interested in the findings of those particular studies. PCI doesn't even qualify for shared decision making. There's no reason to offer it and then discuss it because there's no benefit to offset the risk. He, quote, he says, quote, anecdotes and angiograms are more believable than scientific evidence. I knew evidence didn't matter in politics. I thought since doctors were trained in science and reason, they could be persuaded by evidence. Hidden amongst the ineptitude out there, now my comments, are some marvelous doctors who really do consider evidence when making treatment decisions, and, and other types of practitioners too. We have a dietitian on staff who follows the evidence. I have doctors and nurses who are associated with us and friends of mine who are very interested in the evidence. They're constantly learning more. But there are so few of these people right now that the odds that you're going to end up sitting in front of one, not real great, all right? So you just have to educate yourself and make decisions on your own about your care. Now, I just want to drive home the, the point a little more about, and, and I teach through analogy. Those of you who listen to me all the time know this. I want you to think about what your life would be like if most of the people you purchased products and services from behaved like medical doctors in this particular situation. Take your accountant, for example. What if your accountant told you great stories about how much his clients love him and how much money he saved them on their tax return, but he didn't bother to read revisions to the tax code? Not interested in that. Just um, preparing taxes, making people happy. Everybody smiles when they come in and sign their return. Okay, well, if you had an accountant like that, you'd have to read every line on your tax return because the penalties for signing a tax return that isn't right can range from just paying a fine to even going to prison. The same would be true for all other purchases that would be handled in this way with irresponsible people who don't read the evidence. Think about if your real estate agent never bothered to check the comps in the neighborhood of the house that you're going to buy. Uh, think about washing machine salesmen and car salesmen and everybody else. And I think, I think the difference between medicine and those things is everybody goes into these other types of transactions with the idea that, you know, I probably better check it out for myself. 
my whole point here is that people should ask more questions when they're getting ready to take a drug or have a procedure than they ask when they're getting ready to buy a blender. I think that the two are not really comparable in terms of importance in your life. So the informed consumer chooses providers carefully, asks a lot of questions and carefully considers risks and benefits, and then informs the doctor of choices. And boy, I don't think I've ever done a video clip or written an article that illustrates the importance of this more than this one. You know, and it just shows how irrational the system can be. Mandrola puts forth 61 studies showing this stuff is useless. A bunch of doctors look at scary um, uh, images and, and hear stories and they vote in favor of that. How sad and uh, how unfortunate, but uh, you can't say you haven't been warned. All right, that's all for today. As usual, pass this on to anybody who you think would enjoy watching it, and I'll be back to you on Thursday with more news.